Want to know how to cope with food allergies and still explore the world? Stay tuned as we talk about traveling with food allergies. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. Hey, Tamara, how are you? Good. Catching up on lots of writing from all the travel I've been doing recently. I know that feeling. That's kind of my agenda for the next couple of weeks, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where Hannah's did you away. Oh. Hannah's away at sleepaway camp right now. So, my plan is to just write as much as I can. But the problem with that is when she's away, I get so, I don't know, I miss her so much. So instead of like being able to focus, I'm usually wandering and looking to check for mail or look, look at pictures on the camp website. And so I really need to buckle down and start writing. Yeah. It's kind of tricky. I'm doing our church VBS program and I need to be writing and I deal with, you know, a hundred some kids and then come back afterwards in the afternoon and you hit that afternoon slump right after lunch, yeah. and right after all those kids. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to focus and write. So it can yes. be tough sometimes. So where did you just get back from? Uh, we did a few little trips. I mean, we did the trip to Florida that I talked about and then I uh, took Hannah up to camp. And so she goes to camp in Maine. So we did a quick overnight stay in Portland, which I just, I love the city of Portland. There's such good food there. And we did check out a little um, Portland science uh, museum, which has a special Titanic exhibit on. And so that all kind of kinds of relics from the Titanic and a lot about the history. So that was pretty interesting. Um, but it was really just a quick little visit um, on our way up to camp. Nice. Yeah, I always, you know, being a West Coaster, I think Portland, Oregon, but I, uh, Portland, Maine, I think is one of the bigger, a big ones. So well, it's funny because when I, I got a press release actually from someone to tell me about the Titanic exhibit. So I wrote back to say, actually, you know, I'm going to be up there and I'd really be interested in seeing it. And she wrote back and she said, you know, this is Portland, Maine, right? And I'm like, yes, I understand <laughs> that. Because, <laughs> you know, so many people only think of Portland, Oregon. And yeah. A little Portland, Maine, but they definitely both have good food scenes and they're both great cities. Um, one's just a little smaller than the other. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It'd be fun to see, like, do a comparison of, you know, I wanted to do other. that a, a couple so of years fun. ago. Yeah, because we were up in Portland, Maine, and then Hannah and I were flying into Portland, Oregon before we were going to do some stuff in Central Oregon. Uh, but it ended up we just didn't have time to really spend in Portland, Oregon. But I still want to do that, like comparison yeah. of the two cities. I think that would be fun. Maybe you and I should go on a little like um, yeah. travel retreat to up our podcast game and we can go to both. We'll have to tell the uh, the travel Portland people about that. Yeah, (laughs) visit Portland. So yeah, but then when when we got back, Glenn and I actually went away overnight for a little romantic escape. So it's really we don't have family nearby, so we never get to kind of go away. And even though it's silly, like our house is actually empty, it's still nice to sometimes go away somewhere else where you're not thinking about like doing the laundry and things like that. Yeah, it's very nice, especially since you had Hannah tagging along on your anniversary trip recently. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we love her so much, but she is usually tagging along. So it was nice. I got an invitation recently from the Saybrook Point Inn and Spa to come and check out their new lighthouse suite. And so I just, you know, I've always kind of dreamed about sleeping in a lighthouse. So it definitely was interesting. I was I was up for that. That sounds really cool. There was one night late at night, I was watching a Hallmark movie or something like that. And a guy lived in a lighthouse. So yeah, Yeah, there's something seems romantic. Exactly. There's something romantic about it. And you're not, it's also nice when you're not like isolated on an island, but you actually have, you know, a gourmet restaurant and a spa and a pool and, you know, all the amenities of a hotel. So it was pretty neat. That seems like the way to do lighthouse overstays is the spa and the restaurant right there. (laughs) Yeah. It was neat though. We we got up and saw the sunrise for one of like the first times in my life because I'm such not a morning person. Um, but when we checked in, the bellman that brought us out, basically the lighthouse is out on their marina on the dock. So you walk out 
the docks of the marina to the lighthouse and he was telling us, you know, how there's just water and then you see the sunrise right on the other side, this little strip of land. And he showed us some pictures from it. And I said, you know, I really, I have to set my alarm and get up for that because there's not that many opportunities where you can literally just kind of fall out of bed in your pajamas, open the door and see a sunrise over the water. I mean, usually if you're in a city or a hotel, you'd have to, you know, get dressed and go down somewhere to to do that. So I got some great, great sunrise pictures. It sounds perfect. And yeah, it's it's good to be able to take advantage of that. And then you can always take a nap in the middle of the day. Oh, I went back to sleep. <laughs> oh, there you just <laughs> enough for the photo and then once I'm up, exactly. I'm up for a while. Like, because my first step would be coffee, then sunrise. So, yeah, coffee would have to come first for me. Well, you know, I don't drink coffee, so That's it gets right. hard for me to to stay up at five. And it's <laughs> early here. You know, when I was in Florida, they're like, "Oh, get up to see the sunrise over Cocoa Beach." It, the sunrise is at like six twenty, and of course, I didn't because we were so busy when we were in Florida. I needed like every minute of sleep, but you know, it's an hour earlier up here in the North. So um, I'm not going to be up at 515 for the day on, it wasn't really a day off because we actually kind of left and went back to work for the afternoon, but even still not doing it. It can be, those early mornings are tough. I've been getting up at 6am this week, trying to learn my lines for each morning. (laughs) So I will look forward to sleeping in and I'm Pacific Pacific time. So it's even worse. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was like, how does that work? <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> well, it you sounds should... like you had some good adventures, so that's great. It is. And so I had my little adventures. Now I get to write about them. Everybody can check out We Three Travel and and um I'm sure I'll have some stuff up there about it very soon. Nice. Sounds good. Well, are you ready to talk about allergies, which I know is something very near and dear to my heart? Yes, definitely. I think that's near and dear to a lot of people. So let's talk to Kirsten. Okay, so today we're here with Kirsten Maxwell, and she's the founder of Kids Are a Trip. She writes for TravelingMom.com as Teaching Traveling Mom, focused on the educational aspect of traveling with children. And she's also a former teacher and believes travel is an education and feels fortunate that she can teach her children about different cultures as the family has traveled to 25 countries and counting. Wow, I didn't realize there was that many. And a native Phoenician, Kirsten currently lives in Chicago with her husband and her three boys. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm definitely looking forward to digging into this one since um, we are going to be talking about traveling with allergies. And I know like you, we, um, we travel with allergies because my youngest has severe nut allergies. So I'm definitely excited to hear um, how you guys handle it and kind of see if there's any new ideas for me. Right. I think uh, we've talked about it a little bit before and we're, we're both on the same page when it comes to trying to find what works best for all of us when we're traveling with our food allergy kids. Yeah, as you guys probably both have a lot of great suggestions. So uh, your bio gives you a little background on um, on who you are, but can you give me a little bit more detail on how old your kids are, how many kids you have, that kind of thing? Sure. I have three boys. They are 13, 11, and 9. And uh, we've lived in Chicago now for 11 years, but I, like you said, I grew up in Phoenix and then we lived in San Diego for seven years. So we kind of came from a, a West Coast, warm and sunny to cold Chicago winters. And I still <laughs> am trying to get over the shock, <laughs> even though it's been 11 years. And I think that's why I do travel because I, I can't stay here. I'm kind of like restless and need to get away when it turns cold because it's not just the short winter, it's kind of a longer six month winter. And so uh, any chance I have, have, we try to kind of go away and find warmer climates. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think that's allowed us to experience a lot of great cultures and see different things in the world with our kids. And we've been very fortunate that we've been able to do these kinds of things. I don't blame you for wanting to get away from those winters. I feel the yeah. same with our long winters in New England. I bet. Let's go ahead and move into what type of allergies do you guys deal with with your family when you're traveling? Sure. So my oldest and youngest actually have seasonal allergies, which, you know, as you know, when you go somewhere that has a real high pollen count or 
you know, just depending on time of year, spring can be really bad. You know, when the flowers are blooming, they're, it's beautiful, but it's miserable too. So we're taking a lot of Singular with us or Zyrtec and, you know, popping those little pills, just trying to keep them from having the puffy eyes and, you know, just being clogged up, miserable. And then we have the food allergies as well. Our youngest one has a peanut tree nut allergy. Um, so we're dealing with that and that kind of threw us for a loop after having the older two not having any food allergies. And then, wait, what? I haven't, now I have to learn how to travel with one that has a food allergy. And you start realizing how prevalent food allergies really are in our society because I I really had no clue until we had a child with food allergies. Yeah. So how severe for both of you guys, how severe are they? Kim, you want to go? Well, for Mia, ours are pretty bad. She's had three cases of anaphylaxis that have needed um, two hospitalizations and one we were able to, we just did EpiPen and then she was cleared. So we were good. But yeah, so three, I mean, the nuts are anaphylactic with her. It's, that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand with anaphylaxis. They expect that immediate, like grabbing your throat and gasping for air. And she doesn't present that way on the other times, but the doctors have told us that she's still in anaphylaxis because she's had like the petechial hemorrhaging. So she gets kind of this blood vessel bursting under her skin and then she'll get difficulty breathing and itching really, really bad. And it's a systematic breakdown. And eventually, you know, they can lose blood pressure so bad that they'll just go into, they'll pass out. So it just, uh, that's the biggest thing is that anaphylaxis with allergies doesn't necessarily look like the person grabbing their throat, gasping for air. So... Yeah, and ours is a, you know, it's kind of interesting. The way that we found out he had allergies in the first place was um, my husband and I were on our 10th anniversary trip to Montreal, and we're on a plane, and we landed, and our phone just kind of lit up with all these messages. And we found out my son, who was almost, I think, one at the time, had been rushed to the emergency room. Oh, gosh, that's scary. At the time, we thought it was because he had uh, he was sitting in his high chair with my parents. We're watching him. Had put a bunch of bread, you know, torn up little pieces of bread into his mouth, and they thought he had choked on the bread. Um, but it came to find out later that um, the bread had walnuts in it, and so his throat had started to swell. And he literally, t- I, I'm glad I was not here because I think I would have a much different opinion of the whole thing. Cause I, I kind of like the stand away from it. You see it in a different light, but my mom and dad went through it. My sister happened to be here too, but he turned blue in the face. They called the ambulance. The police were here and they basically saved his life because he was choking to death. And that kind of like, you know, we thought it was a one-off incident, but then shortly thereafter I was feeding him banana walnut muffins. Same thing started vomiting on, you know, onto his tray rash on his mouth, you know, take him to the hospital. And they're like, you need to go get him allergy tested, you know? So, I mean, he wasn't even two yet and you're doing the whole allergy test and you discover like, Hey, your kid has this tree nut peanut allergy. And they gave us a whole list of other things they thought he was allergic to at the time as well. So we kind of went into panic mode and like locked down all the cabinets. Like we can't have anything like that's, that's instantly where your head goes to. Yeah. So it, that's where we started from. Um, now we're in a little different space where it's really, they've been able to eliminate a lot of things over time. Like he can have almonds now where you're like, well, almonds, I guess they're like the least severe, or the most likely to outgrow, if you will, uh, of the, the tree nuts. Um, but he is not like an, it's not an airborne allergy for him. It's an ingestion. He actually has to ingest the nut to have a reaction. And for him, it goes to swollen tongue, swollen lips, and then vomiting. And and knock wood, we've not had to use an EpiPen on him, yet we can control it with Benadryl. Um, and, to, and if it goes to the next step, then it's the EpiPen, obviously. That's where we're at. So what are you, knowing all that, if, and it takes a while just to get to y- learn how to deal with it at home. But what are some of the precautions and the tips that you have, especially with flying? I mean, it's such a an issue, especially for things that are airborne and the airlines still give out peanuts, at least some of them do. Mm-hmm. Like, have you found some are better than other about protecting your kids and making sure that um, you're seated in certain areas or things like that? 
I do have one. I will not fly Southwest because they serve peanuts. Like that is a, a known thing for me. I know it. I don't do it. I just flat out. It's not going to happen with me until they stop serving peanuts. I can't fly that airline. And, and I've actually told the people at Southwest, like, when are you going to change this policy? And, you know, nothing. But, um, you know, wiping down the trays. I mean, for me, I don't call the airlines ahead of time because, Again, it's not an airborne thing for him. Mm. So for us, I can really manage it with just wiping down, you know, the armrest, the seat tray, the tray tables, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we do the same thing. I I have flown Delta and they do serve peanuts and it can be a little frustrating because it, they'll be Delta's actually been really great about not serving it um, for the flight when I alert them. So I do normally call ahead. Ours is not airborne either, but she's pretty sensitive. So uh, I do let them know on her let record locate. They make a note of it on her record. And then when we check in at the gate, I tell them again. And typically the gate agents, at least with my experience with Delta, have been very understanding. I have yet to have a bad one, which I don't necessarily always love Delta Airlines. But in this aspect, I do appreciate that. I would love it even more if they would just stop serving nuts on the plane. But then they will let us pre-board so we can pre-board with the people that need like when they say special assistance. So we pre-board then. And that's normally when I just have her join us on the plane. I tell her not to touch anything. I wipe down our whole row of seats, the seat buckles, the tray tables, anything she might touch. And then bathroom breaks are always the other part is that she goes to the bathroom, washes her hand really well. And I make sure she just doesn't touch any seats and is careful with, you know, the door handles and all that because hers is the um, ingestion. But it, because nut proteins are oil based, they can sit and transfer on surfaces. So when one of her anaphylaxis was at school, and we we're pretty sure it's probably like she was playing on the monkey bars and then rubbed her face. And so just if somebody ate a peanut butter sandwich, it's not a nut free school. So if someone had a peanut butter sandwich and had it on their hands, and then they went out and played on the monkey bars, and then she touched the same place. Um, that's kind of what we think might have happened there. So anyways, but yeah, so when we get on the plane, we just wipe everything down and we make sure that we have our things packed. So we have normally extra EpiPens. So we normally travel with four instead of the typical two. And then we have Benadryl and all that. But we've had great luck. And Alaska Airlines is also one of my absolute favorite airlines. And I'm out of Seattle, so it makes it more convenient. And they don't, they serve like soy nut mixes and stuff like that. So I guess if you have an anaphylactic soy allergy, it's not as nice. But for us, not having the nuts served is huge. For instance, on our Delta flight recently, you know, they were nice enough and everything. But then they came down the aisle selling a, you know, one of their paid snacks that's a trail mix granola. And so I'm like, oh, okay, can you let me know if you sell one of those anywhere near me? And, you know, she's like, oh, it's our least popular item. I'm like, okay, great. (laughs) (laughs) Makes me feel better. I know, yeah. So outside of, you know, EpiPens and Benadryl and uh, things for seasonal allergies, are there other, you must have to travel with a lot of wipes, I imagine. And do you just yeah. use like, like antibacterial wipes or anything like Lysol wipes? Like what do you use? Anything special? Yeah. I just I'm just use using those. antibacterial. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Those antibacterial wipe packs. They're, yep. They've always worked for us. So. Yeah. And then we normally just make sure that she washes her hand often or have some baby wipes or hand ones that work for hands too. So she can wipe her hands off after, before and after she eats and stuff like that. So, yeah. So Kristen, you've also traveled really extensively internationally as we heard 25 countries. And so I'm sure you have to deal with some language barriers and perhaps (laughs) some, you know, some cultures where if, if allergies aren't as uh, prevalent, there may not be as much sensitivity to it. So how do you deal with those things? And do you have to do a lot of research in advance or what, what it would be your tips in terms of deal, traveling internationally? You know, you, you do have to do some research in advance. So um, one of the things that I found is this website called selectwisely.com. And they make allergy translation cards. And so I always recommend that to somebody wherever you're traveling, you know, make sure you, and there's several sites that just happens to be the one I I like because they make laminated cards. So, and they usually sell them in a set so I can have one for myself and one for my husband. It translates everything. Like I have a nut allergy, can tell you what kind of allergy, how to say, call the doctor, I'm having an allergic reaction. I mean, it, it goes through all the different things. It has pictures on it. 
Um, so it's very helpful when you're trying to explain to someone in a restaurant or, you know, at a cafe when you're ordering what you're, you know, you're trying to, the point you're trying to get across. So we have those in about, I think, 10 different languages now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I speak Spanish fluently, so that helps out obviously when we're in Spain and the labeling, um, in, especially in Europe is pretty good because they do it in at least it seems like at least five languages per package. So oh, wow. you can find English or you can find Spanish, usually Italian, French. I mean, and it's enough for me to make sense of, I, I know what words I'm looking for in Spanish. So I can kind of go to a different language and say, oh, yes, that's the word I was looking for that, to say it has nuts. Um, so, and obviously in England, that was the first one, like the jumping off point, like, hey, can we take this allergic kid to the UK. So we did, um, England, Wales, I think we just did the UK, England and Wales with him and to see like test the boundaries. And, and it was fine because obviously everything's in English. So you're like, yay, we could do this. But the allergy cards are extremely helpful. That's not to say like it's a fail proof method because sometimes we've had <clears throat> issues. I had advice and I should probably have not taken it, uh, to a woman who has two children with severe peanut allergies said, you can always eat the gelato. You can always eat the gelato in Italy. Just pick oh, the ones that don't no. have nuts in it. Um, make sure you're, cause they're always washing the, you know, the scooper, just make sure, you know, you tell them beforehand. Okay, great. Cause we had been avoiding all the ice cream. We only would do prepackaged on all of our previous trips. And then we made the mistake of ordering it once and, severe allergic reaction. I don't feel like almost immediately and, um, learned our lesson and we're like, okay, we're not going to do that again. But I feel like, you know, um, the EU is really good about labeling things. So we've kind of stuck to pre packaged goods and, um, the Scandinavia countries really don't have a lot of nuts. Like we learned that like everything's like the fish, the yogurt, the berries, you know, there's, you know, it's just kind of a, it's not nut free, but there are a lot of things they make that just, uh, they're mushrooms, they're gravies. I mean, they're not putting nuts in a lot of food, which is kind of nice. Like, not that I didn't worry, but that I could find a lot of options for him to eat that didn't have nuts in it. So they're like, oh, yeah, nothing. none of these things have nuts. I'm like, are you sure? Like, nothing. I'm like, okay. You know, and it didn't. So versus like Italy, Germany, <laughs> you know, France, there's a lot of nuts, you know. Well, I feel like even in the U.S., you can go to some restaurants and they're very sensitive and they'll talk to the chef and they'll, you know, they'll double and triple check. But other times, you know, they're just like, oh, no, that doesn't have nuts in it. And they don't think about the contamination and and things like that. So I imagine that that is, you know, really challenging when you are dealing with that plus uh, language barriers. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of good to hear where you've had the good experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever had any issues while you were traveling? Because we've been lucky enough, we have not. <laughs> um, unfortunately, yes. Obviously, there was the gelato one I just told you about. Um, when we were in Finland, uh, we made the mistake, and it was probably, I'm going to blame it on jet lag. We were walking through a, an, a marketplace, and they had cheese samples. And we thought, oh, sure, you can sample cheese because it's cheese. Why not? And um uh, Everybody tasted the cheese, and almost immediately my son started having an allergic reaction. And I look at my husband, like, well, get the Benadryl. And he's like, I don't have the Benadryl. I'm like, what do you mean? We left it back in the hotel room because we had literally gone from the airport to the hotel room to go walking. And um, we were about four blocks from our hotel. And so he literally picks up my son and starts running back to the hotel. And I'm with the other two boys. I'm like, the whole way running behind and I'm thinking how do I say ambulance and finish like I have no idea and how do you you know what's the number for 911 and you have all these things running through your head um and thankfully you know all's well the ends well he got him back to the hotel put the you know he's throwing up you get the Benadryl in him you know and, and he was fine but it was really a lesson in like you know you always make sure you have the EpiPen in the pack, you, you know, he has it, I have, like to, to Kim's point, you know, traveling with four EpiPens, I'm like, oh, we've never thought about that, but that is a really good idea, because we're usually with two, but four would be better, yeah. that kind of thing, so, um, yeah. 
It's been, you know, we, we've, that's been one of my biggest things is training, you know, Mia's nine now and it's just getting to the point where, you know, like we were ready to go out to dinner last night and she's like, Oh wait, I need my EpiPen. And so I bought her yeah. a cute little bag and I've just been constantly, constantly, constantly training her because her father will never remember. And so <laughs> if he takes her anywhere, he yeah. never even thinks about it because it's just, it's kind of one of those things like you know how you divide and conquer as a family mm-hmm. and it's one of those things I've always handled. And so it never became kind of his routine. And right. so my biggest thing for her has just been training her that you need to be responsible for this. You need to make sure you're packing your EpiPen or Benadryl every single time you leave this house and have yeah. it always on you. So yeah, and checking at- the expiration dates. Cause that, that yeah. happened to us once, like at this, the ones we had checked into the school were actually expired. Oh, so it's always yeah. a good idea to, check those dates because they don't last long and they're a hefty price right. tag they normally only right. have about a year when when i get them it seems like they're they last about a year yeah. yeah right so do you uh do you also research um either doctors or urgent cares or anything like that or you just more rely on the uh the language cards uh to help you should you need to call an ambulance or find a doctor you know, I, I really, I do rely on the language cards, but when, usually when I arrive in the city, um, I have a pretty good idea of where the, the nearest hospital is, or, you know, I've mapped it out on my phone Right. Uh, when we get there. And I usually know the local emergency number. I mean, those are pretty important things to know, I, especially, I mean, I think of back when we went to Rome, like you got to know, like, it's a huge city. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to call? Yeah. Well, you know, if there's anything that, I mean, I don't even care if it was for the food allergy. I mean, I want to know what do I do in case of an emergency. So, I mean, that's just kind of a a given anywhere we travel. You have to know how to reach an uh, emergency number. Yeah, and it's a little bit easier when you stay at a hotel and there's, you know, 24-hour front desk or concierge or something. But especially if you're doing like an Airbnb or a VRBO, right. uh, you're you're much more on your own. And so knowing those things in advance, I would think would be pretty critical. Yeah. So Kirsten, do you have any great tips or words of encouragement? Because I worry that sometimes families who have allergies, they don't want to travel because it's kind of this unknown, scary thing to them. So do you have any any ideas for them or helpful words for them? You know, I do because it's funny because when we started, I mean, we found out he was one, one and a half and we had a big trip planned. Um, we're doing a road trip from Chicago to Toronto and I instantly panicked. I was like, Oh my gosh, we're, this kid's not going to be able to eat the whole time, you know? And it's not like that at all. There are so many things out there and it doesn't matter if it's a nut allergy or some, or, you know, a soy allergy, dairy allergy, there are foods your child can eat anywhere. And I'm probably not going to give good examples because I'm going to give what my nut allergy child can eat, but he can eat eggs. Okay. You can find eggs anywhere. He can eat yogurt. He can eat, you know, he can drink milk. He's not going to starve is what I'm saying. So, you know, if you can just, and even if there are things, you know, your child likes, like we, the very first trip we took abroad with him, we packed bagel thins. I don't know if you know those bagel thin sure. packs yep. and a jar of sun butter in our packed, in our checked luggage. So we're like, we knew when we got there, even if we couldn't find a thing for him to eat, we knew we could make him a sandwich. So there are, if you want to go that route, because you're worried there won't be anything, do that. And then you always know you could sit at a restaurant and he's going to have his sandwich and he's going to be perfectly happy. But don't be afraid to travel because of a food allergy, because there's there's always fruit. There's always vegetables. I mean, there are so many things in this world to eat and everybody, I mean, that it's not prepackaged. I mean, I think that we've become such a society of convenience that we forget about all these natural things and that the the rest of the world is so much about open markets and going to buy your food on a daily basis that there are so many things out there that do not have allergens in them, you know? Like go down to the market, get a thing, get a banana. I mean, my kid can eat that. I mean, they're not going to starve. So, you know, don't feel like that having allergies is going to prevent you from traveling and having a good time because there's always something that your kid's going to find that they're going to want to eat. Yeah, I think that I think that's perfect. Think? I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I think that that's like grocery stores and markets and things like that. They can be a huge advantage. And, you know, you 
you can just, like you said, pack some of your own snacks that are trusted or look for things that you, you know, that you know are safe. Like you said, bananas or pea pods or carrots or whatever. Just, you know, think about the things that you already trust and you can probably yeah. find a counterpart. I, with the nut allergies, especially, and um, Mia has egg sensitivities too. She can't mm-hmm. have like any undercooked cake eggs so she normally stays okay. away from baked goods so baked goods and nuts are kind of one of the areas when we see these great breads or rolls or something I mean you just avoid all that but there's right. so much else out there and you know there's a lot of name brand uh, products that are sold internationally and you can kind of mm-hmm. go oh. but you can't always be that's the other tip though don't don't think that just because you eat you know Ritz in the states and you're safe that you can go eat Ritz somewhere else because they normally are produced and packaged in different factories. So you still need to be alert and reading ingredients always. And and manufacturing processes can change. So make sure you always check them. Yeah. Check the packaging. Yeah. You see stories about that all the time. Yeah. Well, you guys are both such good examples. I mean, I, I think with everything, when it comes to traveling with kids, it's so much about being prepared and, you know, doing some research and planning in advance and, it sounds like, you know, you have so you gave some good resources and things to do that. So hopefully that will encourage people to to give it a try. Yeah. I hope yeah, so cuz so. it's you know, they need to they deserve to the biggest thing is we don't want our daughter to feel like she's odd or different or it we don't want her allergy to be her identity. So um, exactly. when you start changing your life because of that, then they'll start to feel like that's who they are and so That's right. But Kirsten, we're going to ask you our last question that we ask all of our guests. And that is, what do you like to wear when you travel? <laughs> and I knew you were going to ask this question. I'm like, huh? Okay. So my, what I pack depends on where I go. So I, the only thing I have that's my uniform is what I wear on the plane. Mm-hmm. Always a cardigan, a blouse, my J crew jeans, and my coach loafers. It's like comfortable and it will get me anywhere on a flight, you know, wherever I go, that's just my uniform. Oh, and my Cinda B bag because it's got all these pockets and then it's like, I'm good to go. So that's how I get where I'm going. And, you know, and then I just find something out of my suitcase for the rest of the trip. (laughs) Perfect. It's nice how we have those standard go-tos when you travel, especially with flying, right? You're just like, I know this works. I know where I'm going to put this and that. And it just happens. (laughs) Makes packing easier too. It It does. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us today and chatting about something that's close to my heart. So, Well, thank you for having me. That was fun. Thank you, Kirsten. We'll hopefully talk to you soon about some of your other travels and other destinations. Sounds good. And thank have you for fun having on your again. cruise. Where can everyone follow along? Because you're headed out on a cruise. Well, I guess yeah. by the time they yeah. hear this, you'll be back. But Right, with little Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> so you find me. I'm at Kids Our Trip. I'm at Kids Our Trip on Twitter and Instagram and um, follow along with our family's travels. Sounds good. Thanks. Perfect. Great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Now we're back with our tip of the week. And this tip has to do with food allergies and traveling. And it's something that our family has figured out over time. And it really comes in handy. And that is at like certain theme parks or events where they don't allow you to bring in your own food. For safety reasons, you might not be comfortable eating the food at a theme park. I know I kind of, especially when there's a lot of maybe teenagers or non-educated food service people helping you, you always wonder if there's cross-contamination or any food issues and you want to just be safe. And a lot of times, I've never had a situation where this didn't work, but theme parks and other destination attractions will allow families with food allergies to bring in their own little um, meal. So you could pack your own lunch for your family or your kid with allergies so that that way you can make sure that everyone stays safe while you're eating and there's no extra issue with that. So it's kind of a handy tip if you're traveling and headed to an attraction that doesn't allow outside food or drink. That's really good. Uh, And I'm glad to hear that because I think it's ridiculous, frankly, the way that theme parks don't allow things in. When I was on that trip to Florida, we were going into a water park and one of the girls with us just had like a bag of 
I don't know, like goldfish or something in her bag. Like she wasn't trying to like sneak it in and just, you know, you kind of always carry some snacks in your bag and they were, they were going to make her throw it out. And she's like, I promise I won't eat it. And it, it's like clearly the only reason to do that is to get you to buy stuff in the park. So I'm glad that they accommodate people with food allergies because yeah, I wouldn't want to take that, that risk. Yeah, it's very good. I know Disney is awesome about it as long as it's not like glass containers or hard sided things. They're amazing at letting you bring in your own stuff. And sometimes I think with um, like zoos and those kind of things, it's for the safety of the animals. So they're, they try to be a little more careful, but we've still been fine. And I've actually, I think only once had to talk to, they had to call a supervisor over. Um, and I think that was it. Not Sperry yeah. Farm. Um, but then they said, okay, no problem. And so it worked out well. Well, that makes sense, but I'm glad. Great. Yeah. So I also just wanted to give a little shout out to Nikki, who is at Starfish Living on Twitter. She uh, sent me a tweet and she's clearly a listener of Vacation Mavens. And she said she loves our podcast. So thank you so much, Nikki. Thanks, Nikki. It's awesome. And anyone else, if you want to tweet us with any ideas on episodes or feedback, anything like that, please um, go right ahead. We're at Vacation Mavens on Twitter. And so make sure also to join us next week. We're going to be talking to Robin Hudson from Lux Recess, and we're going to be talking about luxury Disney World. So a whole new way to do Disney World, and we're going to get her terrific insights. So stay tuned if you have ever thought about doing Disney a little bit more upscale. Awesome. Can't wait to hear what she has to share. All right. Talk to you guys next week. 